Good afternoon to you. Mark Suttoth, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your Hurricane Outlook and Discussion for Monday, August 6, 2018. Start off today's long discussion, and it's usually a lengthy one on Monday because we look at a lot more than just what's going on in the tropics, in the immediate vicinity of land and whatnot. We also take a gander at sea surface temperature anomalies, check on the state of the ENSO, or El Nino Southern Oscillation, and other interesting things, hopefully. So first of all, this is the updated Noah Nesdis anomaly chart for today. You notice that most of the main development region out here is right where it should be or just slightly below, below normal through here. And that's pretty much the case. It's come up uh, so that it's less than half a degree Celsius on average below the long-term average, normal average, whichever way you want to look at it. And uh, certainly well above the long-term average up in the North Atlantic. The Gulf of Mexico a little bit warmer just depending on where you are. All in all, the Atlantic Basin warm enough for hurricane activity. It just depends on what the rest of the atmosphere uh, above the ocean is behaving like. Is it moist? Is it dry? Is there shear? Is there not shear? Things like that. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Also notice these two cold patches that have developed in the ENSO regions of the Pacific a little bit warmer than the long-term average here just off of South America towards the Galapagos Islands. But uh, this area in particular is quite interesting to me because it signifies a cooling trend in the Nino 3.4 area right over on the east side of it. Uh, this is where those colder blobs are showing up. And I figured I'd finally put this up to show you what we talk about when we talk about these Nino regions. And there's the 1-2 area. It's south of the equator off of South America. The Nino 3 area, as you can clearly see, and then the, uh, the 4 area. And then the 3-4 sort of encompasses the 2 like a Venn diagram. And if we go back and look at the anomaly chart, yep, yeah, right here in the eastern Pacific at about 120 degrees of longitude, and then extending to about 170 is the Nino 3-4 area. That's a pretty good approximation. And so there's some cold anomalies showing up in that area. And as such, I believe the Climate Prediction Center showed that the average temperature across this region was about 0 0.10, roughly, about a tenth of a degree Celsius above average. So we are not near El Nino thresholds, just not there. Now, that being said, water temperatures up here in the main development area of the Pacific. And you think about the main development region in the Atlantic, 20 north to about 10 north down here. This corridor pretty much stretches across the deep tropics around the globe. And it you know certainly is that way in the Pacific here. And this is where we have a bulk of the activity. Of course, we have Hector out here approaching uh, well to the south, though, but approaching the Hawaiian Islands. I want to make it very clear that it's going to be well to the south. Um, seeing a lot of wrong information out there and want to make sure it's right from this source anyway. So overall, by and large, water temperature profile, a little change this week because the Pacific has cooled some and the Enso regions and the Atlantic, you know, all in all, it's below what we saw last year by a pretty wide margin. And I'm going to show you more of that in just a moment, uh, comparing at least we're looking at the upper ocean heat content for today. We'll get to that in a moment though. So this is what it looks like in the subsurface. This updated on the 1st of August, so it's fairly recent. And it shows quite a fractured, you know, got this big area in here of uh, neutral to slightly below average. And really the only area of positive anomalies is right here in the eastern Pacific. Everything else neutral or, you know, slightly cooler. No signs of a significant ENSO warming event. Fancy way of saying there's not an El Nino coming any time in the next month or two. It just doesn't look like it. Uh, maybe in the winter towards spring, but even that's not guaranteed. And I've seen some people talking that maybe this will uh, end up being a false alarm. Maybe. It's still too soon to say. But honestly, for August, September, and probably early October, the equatorial Pacific here, looking back at the surface map, this is not going to be warm enough to generate a tremendous amount of rising motion to just completely thwart the Atlantic hurricane season, especially in the Caribbean. But we'll see. Maybe it will. 
uh, because the atmosphere is trying to behave that way, but it certainly isn't coming from these any positive anomalies down here. At least that's my opinion on it. All right, so moving along to the upper ocean heat content, I want to focus on this each week more and more, and uh, you'll see that the shadings here, let's use a different color, red. Um, these different shadings here, this is the lower end of the scale of the upper ocean heat content, and you, know, you can see that it encompasses a pretty large area of the Atlantic Basin, including the tropical Atlantic. It's just that last year it was much more north. You know, we had a lot more area. It was more like this, if I recall. I forgot to put last year's up there, but that's fine. Um, nevertheless, in the western part of the basin, and this is where we live, the upper ocean heat content is substantial, and it's just a matter of time, and it's still going to be a while probably another two weeks at least, but it's waiting. Water temperatures are waiting for something to come along. But notice, this is the Cabo Verde Islands, used to be called the Cape Verde Islands, and there is some significant upper ocean heat content creeping towards that area. And you know the bottom of the scale is here, and this has some coloration with it, and it's showing up. And we can look at the actual sea surface temperatures there from the Reynolds update, uh, that came out recently. When is this? The 5th. So this is yesterday. And I mean, looky here, folks. Let's draw with it uh, blue. Where's blue? There you are. 26 degrees Celsius. That's what I'm looking for. That's the threshold for hurricanes to get started, generally speaking. And I'm just going to outline it for you here, playing trace the outline. It's kind of like being in kindergarten again. Way up in the North Atlantic. Look at that. That's pretty remarkable how far north the 26 Celsius line is getting close to 40 degrees latitude you know, near the US. But more importantly, this is 10 degrees latitude right here. Okay, And so sufficient warming has taken place so that as these tropical waves come off over here, uh, you know, as long as they don't come off over Morocco, um, and you know, they could lose latitude and get pushed to the southwest. But this is warming up. And you think about another two weeks from now, that magic August 20th date. And I'm going to try to draw that in here. 8-20 is usually when the tropics really start to heat up. And the climatological probability of things developing, you know, for the lack of a better way of saying it, really starts to go up. So two weeks from now, you know, I'm going to save this picture. Okay, this is August 6th. Let's save it. And let's see where the 26 Celsius isotherm is in two weeks. You know, this could be more over to the east. This could be further, farther to the north. Almost screwed that up. <laughs> and um, uh, see, it threw me for a loop. I hate that. I got to have it grammatically correct. It's just a stickler thing of mine. I do it in my writing, and I like to be accurate when I talk as well. Anyhow, uh, we'll see how much farther to the north these isotherms get and it'll really start to matter then because as these tropical waves roll off we'll see less and less Saharan air and then it'll be a matter of the warm water temperatures creating instability above those temperatures because of moisture latent heat released into the atmosphere uh, waiting that's why it's called latent it's waiting and you know we're almost there I mean not that anybody's like yeah bring on the hurricanes you know, we want to track them and see where they go. It's an interesting pastime for people. Some people have a, a very intimate connection with whether or not there's going to be hurricanes because they have property along the coast, and they need to know there's one coming their way. I get that. There's all kinds of interest in hurricane activity. And, you know, you're, until we know that they are extinct, and that's not going to happen anytime soon, we're going to be on the lookout for them. So things are getting closer but, you know, it's a watched pot if there ever was one with the Internet the way it is these days. And you can look at satellite pictures and updates and whatever, you know, every five minutes or something like that. Wow, that is definitely, certainly, you know, you think about that analogy in the uh, a watched pot never boils. All righty, so it's boiling, not in the Atlantic, really. I mean, this is an Invest 97L, which we'll look at more in a moment. But elsewhere, yeah, you know, East Pacific, Central Pacific now. Hector knocking on the door of being a Category 5, it looks like. This is another invest area. 94E. We have John 
and then we have Ileana, and this is going to be a really interesting thing that happens with these three systems over here. Um, you could write quite a steamy novel <laughs> about the intertwined craziness that's going to go on between you know this one, which is John and Ileana, and I can't even remember what the next one's going to be. Uh, my apologies, but. We're going to keep this G-rated, but I'm going to show you some interesting things in the modeling that uh, those with creative minds, you can make up whatever you want. And then, of course, in the West Pack, uh, we have a typhoon. Do you say that? Shan Shan. Uh, this is going to impact Japan with quite a lot of heavy rain. All right. So in the Atlantic 97L, what does that look like on satellite? Um, I was going to pull up the Tropical Tidbits loop, but there are a couple of missing frames, at least one, and at the end of the loop so I was like well we won't worry about it today there's some kind of a glitch and so we'll just look at the still frame here of the wide Mercator projection shot from the National Hurricane Center this is just discombobulated you know there is a little bit of convection here nearer the center if you want to call it that uh, an open ocean gale center over marginally tropical favorable waters whatever um, it's the only thing to talk about, really. But notice more and more convective activity in the intertropical convergent zone. Uh, I understand that Grenada down here is the A long or is it Grenada? And please do correct me in the comments. I do not mind. It's either Grenada or Grenada, or maybe you say it both ways. I don't know. But you got the southern windward islands down here, and Grenada was rocked by some very heavy rain recently from a tropical wave. And that moved through, and um, it got past me. I didn't even notice it until somebody posted it on the Hurricane Track Facebook page, and it has had quite a lot of response since then. So there's more energy gathering down here, and it could lift far enough north to reach the southern windward islands. Certainly, Trinidad, Tobago, you know, be on the lookout for that. Uh, you don't have to have a name storm to drop a lot of rain in some of these areas. The way it focuses and the mountainous terrain and the little valleys you got there and the narrow roads and the rivers that wind through you can get a lot of problems from that so just something to keep in mind I didn't want to ignore what I read about that down in the southern windwards in the eastern Pacific yep lots of things happening 94 E on its way to developing we already have John so let's click on John and take a look at the map and it'll move out away from the Mexican coastline and the Baja, so that's good. Now looking at Ileana, Ileana paralleling the Mexican coastline, bringing some impacts here to land. So this is the first time that we've seen this. Luckily, it'll be reserved mainly to uh, squalls, you know, maybe a gusty wind event here or there, an increase in surf, so certainly not a direct hit by uh, a major system, but close enough there as Ileana becomes a hurricane to bring some impacts. So keep that in mind in the southern Baja Peninsula. Yeah, you might have some impacts from there as well. And then, of course, out in the Central Pacific, we have Hector, now under the responsibility of the Central Pacific Hurricane Center. And as you can see, you know, just drawing a line between these two forecast points, Hector will remain well to the south of the big island of Hawaii, there will be an increase uh, very soon uh, in wave activity that will hit mainly the southeast facing beaches and then as it goes past the southwest facing and then eventually those waves will come up here to the remainder of the island chain maybe an increase in some rainfall this convergence overall I mean this is a, a hole in the atmosphere if you will a low pressure area and it's you know it, it'll bring some easterly winds through here and that might change the trajectory of your trade showers or whatever you get. So it may be an enhancement. It won't be a zero impact event, but I'd give it like a 2.8 out of 10, something like that. All right? Uh, Mark's just made up impact scale out of a score of 1 to 10. 10 is Katrina, Andrew, Labor Day hurricane, you know, like run for your lives, holy terror, that kind of thing. Um, Irma comes to mind in the uh, islands last year that's a 10 you know, forget the category 5 wind scale I don't say forget it but in terms of impact the whole ball of wax when you consider everything I would say this is about a 2.8 for the Hawaiian Islands 
if you ask me. All right, so let me show you this. Really fascinating since the Atlantic is still dead uh, on arrival, so to speak. Okay, what's what? That's Hector, okay? This is that typhoon out in the West Pack, Shan Shan, whatever it's called. This is a big upper level low. This is a big mid level, probably deep level layer ridge. Interesting to see the two right next to each other. Fascinating in and of itself. This would be the Hawaiian Islands. Oh, look, I've drawn almost a face. Lovely. Uh, this is 94E. Boy, it's a good thing I know all where everything is. This is John, and this is Ileana. These are the different uh, relative vorticity signatures. 850 millibars up in the atmosphere, or about 5,000 feet up. So when I put all this into motion, we're going to watch it a couple of times. Notice what happens to um, mainly, well, everything. We'll just, I'll shut up and we'll put it into motion. Check this out. This is a week's worth of animation here. First, let's watch Hector. There's the big island of Hawaii right there. Hector goes to the south at a comfortable distance. Good. Now, the uh, animation will reset itself here, and then we'll pay attention to what goes on over in this region with John and Ileana and the next system. Here we go. So look, there's Ileana right there. It circulates around John. John absorbs Ileana, moves on up, and then 94 develops, and it comes towards John. And then you get this torrid affair. Yeah, kind of like, what's John doing? You know, like I said, write your own ending, but, you know, not here. <laughs> Keep that to yourself. It's the Fujiwara effect where they will rotate around each other uh, and the weaker system gets absorbed by the larger system. You know, tropical cyclone domination at its best. And I'll just leave it at that. Really interesting to see, though. And luckily, no major impacts to land as this is happening. So that's good. You can watch the tropics with fascination and interest over there. Look at that. That's so neat to see a meteorological rarity. Um, you know, kind of a waltz, if you will. Maybe we could get some waltz music to play as that's happening. Maybe, just maybe some of this moisture can get torn off and put into the desert southwest over the next week or so, enhancing the monsoon a little bit. We'll have to see about that. So there you go. The Atlantic Basin... Nope, nothing happening to speak of. Everything's in the Pacific for now. And you know what? You know, August 20th, that's, I keep referring to that. I'm going to start like a countdown. You know, instead of a clock starting like you're running a race um, where it goes up to the finish, you know, when everybody's done, I'm going to do a countdown clock. You know, somewhere, somehow I'm going to find one. And uh, we're going to set it to, you know, from August 20th to October 15th. However many hours that is, I will find one, you know, an app or something, and we're going to do it, and it's going to count to zero. And let's see what happens between August 20th and October 15th, because that's normally the magic window of when activity is usually going to happen, right? We know that. And once we get to August 20th and we start that clock, whatever time I do my update that day, the clock will start, and we'll see. And if we're not noticing an uptick in the global models, you know, and I know they're not gospel, but they're pretty good at sniffing out patterns. And if we're just stuck in this pattern, it could be a very, very dry hurricane season to come. And that's obvious, but that's just my line in the sand. We're going to wait and see August 20th and beyond. Uh, between now and then, yeah, there'll be plenty to talk about as we, you'll see it'll go by quickly, believe me. And then when something forms, which it should eventually, We'll be on top of it. All righty? So that is it for me for today. As always, thanks for tuning in. I'm Mark Suddeth. For HurricaneTrack.com, I will be back with more for you tomorrow.